When I was growing up in the 1950s and 1960s, it was assumed that if you were a bright girl and your family could afford it, you would go to college. And when you graduated, you had four choices, teacher, librarian, nurse, or wife. But when I graduated from college in 1972, I had many more choices. Recently, I read Betty Friedan's memoir, Life So Far, and realized that I had had many more choices in part because of Betty Friedan and her book, The Feminine Mystique. Now, when I was reading her memoir, I, it was, I found it fascinating and quite surprising. I had always assumed, based on no data, that Betty had been born an activist and had been pushing the envelope every moment of her life. But that was not the case at all. She grew up in the Midwest in the 20s and 30s, and she was a bright girl whose family could afford her to send her to college, and she had the same four choices. When uh, graduating, teacher, or assumed she'd have the same four choices, teacher, librarian, nurse, or wife. Now, she went to Smith College, and she won the Freshman Honors Prize. She became a psychology major, and she was the editor of the newspaper. And she changed it from being a weekly newspaper to coming out several, several times during the week. She got enough advertisers to support it. She got enough staff to, to fill the pages. Um, she, was, she was quite a compliment to the Smith campus. And at Smith, the Smith graduates had a couple of other choices. That it was assumed that if you were very good in your major, you would go on to graduate school. Or if you were a good writer, you would go to New York City and do research for a magazine until you were married. Betty Sitt wrote in her memoir, it never occurred to me that as editor of a college newspaper, I was qualified to work for perhaps even the New York Times or another big city newspaper. I know my counterparts at Yale and Harvard were expecting to do just that, but it never occurred to me, even though working on a newspaper was what I had loved most in, in everything that I had done in my life. Well. Betty was, as I said, a psychology major, and she won a one-year fellowship to UC Berkeley. So off she went to UC Berkeley. During a faculty symposium, she presented her honors thesis that she had written at Smith. And afterwards, her advisor said, Betty, that was fabulous. You could have used that as your master's thesis or even your PhD dissertation. Based on that, the psychology faculty nominated Betty for the largest fellowship given to scientists at UC Berkeley, and she won it. It had never been won by a psychologist before, never been won by a woman. Betty's asthma got worse, and she broke out in welts all over her body. Her boyfriend, a physicist whom she was mooning over, took her for a walk on the hills above UC Berkeley to give her a break from everything that was going on. She said, oh, Bob, thank you. It's, it's so good to get away from, from campus for a little while. And he said, Betty, we're through. I could never win a fellowship like that. Betty wrote, I was crushed. And then she decided to forget about a career and just concentrate on being a woman. Remember, this was uh, now 1943. Freud was really big in the psychology field. And Freud wrote, it is woman's nature to be ruled by man and her sickness to envy him. Yeah. So Betty did not accept the fellowship, which would have taken her all the way through her PhD, paid for all of her classes and everything else. She dropped out of grad school. 
I thought, Betty, you didn't need to drop out of grad school. You just needed to find a more supportive boyfriend. Well, maybe there weren't a lot of them around in 1943. I don't know. Yeah. So Betty did go to New York City and work for a newspaper, but it was a newspaper run by a labor union. So it wasn't the, the high Times. ranking, no. She got married the following year to a man who worked in the theater as a stage manager. So his job wasn't the kind of you know, steady employment that a family might need. Betty continued working, and she always felt badly when she made more money than he did. The next year, she had a baby. She took a year's uh, leave of absence and then went back to work. A few years later, she got pregnant again, and she was fired. She wasn't even given any reason why. But then she found out she was fired because she was pregnant. And Betty finally got mad. I was, I was proud of her then. Um, she went to the head of her union and said, I want you to file a grievance. This isn't fair. I was fired because I was pregnant. It's your own fault. File a grievance for me. He just shrugged. Betty wrote, there was no term at that time as sex discrimination, but I knew it wasn't right. I was fiercely uh, aware of the injustice of it. But I decided to become a freelance writer and write articles for women's magazines. Her asthma came back, and when she went to her psychoanalyst, he said, Betty, Maybe your problem is that you need to be a more serious writer. Oh, I can't do that. Betty, didn't you graduate summa cum laude from Smith? You should take yourself more seriously. Oh, I can't do that. But finally, in 1957, three things happened that changed the way Betty looked at things. The first was she read an article about uh, written by two Freudian psychoanalysts, a man and a woman. This article said that perhaps American women were not content with their role as wives because they were overeducated. Now, how a woman who was a psychoanalyst, who was clearly overeducated and had a career, could write that, I don't know. But Betty also finally got really mad. She said, how could they write that? I valued my education, even though I didn't feel I used it particularly well. And how could my education make me a worse wife and mother? I had bought everything Freud had been selling. Hadn't I given up my big fellowship at Berkeley and dropped out of grad school? Hadn't I given up my career as a, a newspaper reporter? But this was too much. The second thing that happened was that Betty was asked to write a questionnaire for her class reunion. It was their 15th reunion. When she analyzed the results, she found that women who were just, um, their lives were completely in the box of wife and mother were depressed or frustrated. And those who had outside interests were more content with life. And those who didn't even recognize that the box existed were really thriving. The third thing that happened was at the reunion. Betty came back to the dormitory she was staying in late and found that she and some of the seniors were locked out. She asked them, do you still have curfews? Oh, yes. One of us has gone to get the janitor. He'll let us in in a little while. So Betty said, Remembering the wonderful time she had had at, at Smith. What courses were you re really interested in? And they all looked at her and said, we just went to school here. Well, uh, one said, I'm really interested in my future with my fiance. Every weekend I visit him and we discuss his career and where we're going to live. I want to have four children and live somewhere where I can ice skate with them a lot during the winter. Betty said, 
Uh, weren't there any campus groups that you were active in that you enjoyed, like the school government or, or the newspaper? Oh, no, we weren't interested in that. We're just looking forward to our future. Betty couldn't believe it. Those four choices were now down to one, wife. And she wanted to figure out what had happened. So she wrote an article for McCall's magazine suggesting that women were not happy with their role uh, in American life, not because they were overeducated, but because the role was not right. McCall's declined to publish that. A number of other magazines declined to publish it. So Betty wrote a book.